Now, of course, we've got Christmas coming up in a couple of days. And I, I, this is personally my favorite holiday of the year. I love celebrating Christmas. I love getting together with our family and spending time with my immediate family and, and you know, giving gifts to each other and just, just the time we get to spend being off from work and just being able to enjoy each other and, and just this whole time of year. There's so much to Christmas. It's not even just the family. I mean, it's just everything involved with it. I love the Christmas hymns. I love the, the great... I love in, in such a dark world that we can still have... There's still a remnant of this once great country being a Christian nation. It's, there's still people who will say Merry Christmas. There's still people who decorate and will honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if there's a lot of heathen out there, even if there's a lot of people that are unsaved, that maybe they're just going through the motions. Hey, at least there's still some semblance of people who love the Lord and are honoring Him and want to set aside a day to honor His birth. And, and that, that brings joy to my heart. I like seeing that. This is a time of year. You know, think what you will of Christmas. I think it's great for the fact that it opens up extra doors to talk to people about salvation, to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what in the world are we celebrating Christmas for anyways? It's something that's real common. It's a part of our culture and our life. Hey, it's real easy to bring up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at this time of year. There's so many reasons why I love it. And what we're going to be preaching about tonight is the spirit spirit of Christmas because we also have it you know we live in a world that has that perverts everything everything gets twisted Christmas turns into this highly commercialized day that it's all about sales I mean it starts right after Thanksgiving you know the day you're supposed to be thankful for what God has blessed you with and just what you have to be focused on all the things that you don't have to run out and start buy 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 and run up your credit card and get all this stuff because Christmas is coming up and you need to get these great sales and you need to be shopping and spending and shopping and spending and and getting all hectic just to get ready for Christmas when that's not what Christmas is about at all and it's easy to get caught up in that it really is. And, and we need to be able to fight against that compulsion because that's what's being pumped at you all the time. That's what the media is doing. I mean, you get billboards, radio, TV, whatever. Everything is just hitting you with spend. The internet, I mean, all over the place. We are being prompted to just spend, spend, spend. And you get focused on everything else. Even at home, let's say, you know, the commercial thing, you've got that covered pretty well. It doesn't bother you so much. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But what about even just getting things ready for your family? It tends to be, you know, around the holidays are real stressful times because maybe you're having family over and you're trying to get the house ready and everything needs to be clean. And everything needs to be in its proper place. And then tensions, the stress starts rising and then people are getting less sleep and you start getting irritable and cranky and, and fighting with each other. And, you know, holidays is probably one of the biggest times where there's big family blow-ups because people get so stressed out over the whole thing. And you, put, you end up putting too much emphasis on the day than what it's, the day is even supposed to be about to begin with. So as we get into this Christmas, we want to, well, I'm going to teach tonight, which is probably common knowledge among everybody here, but we need to get a refocus of our attention in the right place. So you may not walk away having some brand new knowledge tonight, but that's okay. Not every single sermon is going to give you all brand new things. But we need to keep our mind focused on what is right and what, why are we celebrating Christmas to begin with? Let's keep that as the primary source and keep that in our minds as we get closer. We've got the next couple days that, that we don't end up getting in all these fights and stuff and, and get so caught up with how much money we're spending and, and on spending on everybody else. Look, that's not what it's about. We saw the birth story here, but before I even get into Luke chapter 2, because the... the incredibleness, the, the, the amazing thing that, that happened on Christmas with Jesus Christ being born. We, we have to start off with who Jesus Christ even is. And that's, that's the, the, the Godhead, the, the one part of the three in one God that became flesh, that became a man. Jesus Christ, God humbled himself to become a man like one of us. And this is a big deal. And there, there are false religions out there who do not believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And that just brings down this event to not be quite as important and significant as it actually is. 
If Jesus Christ was just some other man, he was not just some other man. I'm going to read, you could turn to these scriptures if you'd like. I'm going to be going through a, a multitude. And if you'd like to take notes, maybe you don't have all of these, these references memorized. But if you ever want to show somebody in the Bible just undeniable proof that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, we're going to read through some of these, write them down, write down the ones that you think might be the most powerful and the most hard-hitting where you can just say, hey, look, this is God in the flesh. And there's no denying this. We were out soul winning last week and we talked to this lady that um, thought it was ridiculous, thought it was some strange thing, like we have some strange doctrine that Jesus Christ was somehow he was God. And, and I've heard this so many times. Well, who was Jesus praying to then if he was God? You know, because he was praying to the Father. Who was he praying to if, if he's just God? You know, and people will come up with these things. Now look, I believe the Bible. The Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's in 1 John chapter 5. It says, These three are one. So, to say, because you think that might be strange... The Bible refers to the Godhead as being a triune God, being three aspects, three manifestations of one God, of one Lord, one Father. But we're going to see it. I'm going to get into this a little bit. I want to prove this tonight because it is such a major part of the Christmas story that Jesus Christ was born, God in the flesh. God became a man. So the first place I'm going to turn to here is Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to see another, another account of Jesus Christ's birth in the book of Matthew. Of course, we read through Luke chapter 2. You can put a bookmark in Luke chapter 2 if you'd like. We're going to get back to that after I get through the whole deity of Jesus Christ and just proving that from Scripture and seeing these amazing Scriptures regarding Jesus Christ and regarding His birth being so important and significant. Verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 1, the Bible reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. This is extremely important because never has there ever been a child born of a virgin, of someone who has not had a physical seed and a physical egg come together inside of the womb to, to conceive and bring forth a child. So right from the very beginning, it's a miraculous event. It says here that Mary was espoused to Joseph. They had not um, completed their, their marriage. They have not uh, consummated their marriage, even though they were, they were espoused to one another. Before they actually came together and did that, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon her, and, and Jesus was conceived in her womb. Verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Joseph was thinking about divorcing her because he finds out, hey, she's pregnant. And under every other circumstance in the world, there's only one way that could happen. So Joseph is thinking about these things. Obviously, he's got to be really sad and upset because she's with child. But verse number 20, it says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared on him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. So this is a big deal. Joseph's confronted with his angel, and he's like, the angel's saying, okay, look, don't worry about this. This is actually from the Holy Ghost. And what an honor that must be to be confronted, just, just to be, I'm going to be the stepfather of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's going to come and save the whole world from their sins. It says in verse 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So this is the first reference I want to bring up here about Jesus Christ, his birth. The name Emmanuel literally means God with us. 
Now, this isn't the most concrete evidence, but this is just one aspect. And what I'm going to do, we're going to go through a lot of verses. The next place I'm going to turn to is Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, and Isaiah 9, 6 is an extremely famous verse. And it's also a verse that I love turning to. So when you want to talk to, say, for example, a Jehovah's Witness... This is a good reference. Some of the references I'm going to bring up, they change in their, in their perverted Bible, the New World Translation. This is not changed to get the point across. You can actually look this verse up in their, in their perverted Bible and you can still show what I'm going to show you tonight so that this has not been corrupted to the point to where it's no longer a valid point to them if they want to rely on their translation. Isaiah 9, 6 for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who is this referring to? Obviously this is talking about Jesus Christ, the birth of Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Look at this. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. Look at the next phrase. The Mighty God. And how about this one? The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These are names of Jesus Christ, the son that was to be born. The mighty God. You know, I've talked to people and say, oh, yeah, he was the mighty God, but he's not the almighty God. And they try to make that distinction. They say, well, then how many gods do you believe in? You claim to believe that there's one God. Then what is Jesus Christ? Is he another God? Do you believe in multiple gods? Jesus Christ is the mighty God, but even further than that, he's the everlasting Father. You're saying that the Son is the Father. And this is what the, this woman I was talking to last week was trying to say is ridiculous. How could the Son be the Father? And, you know, the Bible says it right here that he was the everlasting, he is the everlasting Father. That's his name. His name shall be the everlasting Father. Jesus Christ, the everlasting Father. Verse number 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So great passage right here just proving that, look, the child that is to be born, Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the scripture is the mighty God in the flesh. The everlasting father became a human being. Hebrews 1.8, I mentioned this in the announcements. It's our memory verse for this week. You can look it up right in, the, right in the bulletin here. But unto the Son he saith. Now when you get this in context in Hebrews chapter 1, unto the Son he saith, the he that it's referring to right there is God. This is God doing the speaking. God the Father. Unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So there we have God the Father doing the, the narration, doing the speaking, and talking to the Son and calling Him God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Once again, proving the from, from the mouth of God the Father, proving the deity, the Godhood, part of the Godhead, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16 the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God became a man. He was manifest in the flesh. Now that's one of those verses, if you're taking notes, if you are talking to a Jehovah's Witness, this is changed in their Bible because it's very clear in the King James Bible it says without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh God became a man in their book it just says he was manifest in the flesh so it completely removes the power of God becoming a man being manifest in the flesh and just saying he so it's a great verse I still use it because the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two any two-edged sword and when you show this to people it's a great verse to use because it's God's word that can that can divide even to the the soul and spirit but um, just so that you're aware that is something that they change in their version John chapter 1 one of my favorite places to prove the deity of Jesus Christ, right? In John chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You say, well, I don't understand that. How can the Word be with God and be God at the same time? 
Because we have a triune God, because there are three manifestations of the Lord, of God. And then just to prove that the word is Jesus Christ that it's referring to, it says in verse number 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. He was made flesh. He existed. He, it's not like when Jesus Christ was born that that's the moment that he, that, that he was created or that he existed. Jesus Christ has existed as long as God has existed. Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He just became a man. He took on a human form when he was born in that manger. John 3, look at verse number 13. John 3. John 3.16, real famous verse. You go up, there's a few verses from John 3.16. You got John 3.13. Jesus Christ himself, while he was speaking on this earth, said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Jesus Christ himself said, he says, look, he was the Son of Man. And while he was speaking on this earth, he said, which is in heaven. He said that he was in heaven. God can't be bound. Now, he took on some limitations by becoming a human being. We'll get into that in a little bit. And that's another amazing feat and aspect that God is capable of even doing these things. But God's capable of doing anything. John 3.13, uh, yeah, 3, great verse showing the deity of Christ. John chapter 5. We're going to run through real quickly a lot of, a lot of these verses in, in John. John 5, verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. By Jesus Christ, even claiming to be the Son of God, he made himself equal with God. And that's the truth. And it's not that they just thought he was equal with God. The narrator of the Bible in this verse is saying that he made himself equal with God. And that's why they hated him and wanted to kill him. That's one of the main reasons why the Jews sought to kill Jesus Christ. Because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. They didn't believe he was Christ. They didn't believe he was the Son of God. And they say, you are making yourself equal with God by claiming you're the Son of God. And that's exactly right, and that is what he was doing. And the Bible says so right here. And he said, my Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 58. John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was... I am. Now, you could go back, listen to my entire sermon on John chapter 8. I fleshed this out a lot in a much more great detail. In John 8, three times Jesus makes the reference that he, that he is the I am. If you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Je you know, I am is, was how God referred to himself to Moses in the burning bush. He said, well, who should I say sent me? God, when they ask me, say that I am hath sent you. Jesus Christ right here said, before Abraham was, I am. He is claiming to be God, the I am that sent Moses from the burning bush. That's Jesus Christ. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. They wanted to kill him again because they knew what he was saying. They knew what he was implying, that he was God in the flesh. John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Again, Jesus Christ speaking. He said, he is one with the Father. John 20, verse 27. John chapter 20, right near the end of the book of John, we see the story of doubting Thomas, right? Thomas was one that said, unless I could stick my hand, my fingers in the holes of his hands and thrust my hand into his side, he said, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe that he came back. That's why I call him doubting Thomas. But this is really important to understand. Now, we know the Ten Commandments, right? We know that the Bible, that, that, of the, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, God said not to make, he doesn't want any idols, and he says, there should, be, you know, there should be no God before me. You cannot bow down and worship, whether it's a man, a beast, an idol, nothing. You cannot worship any other God but God alone. God is a jealous God. God said his name is jealous. 
One of the major reasons why God has, had, had been judging Israel is when they went into idolatry and started worshiping and serving false gods, He would bring them into captivity and He'd judge them until they would get right and repent and turn back to the Lord. Look at what we see with Thomas and Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 27 of John 20. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Look at how Thomas answers him. Verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He's saying this to Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God. Now does Jesus say, No, no, hold on a second, Thomas. I'm not God. I'm just a man. I was a perfect man. I'm the Savior of the world, but I'm just a man, Thomas, please. You know, we see, we see the Apostle Paul doing that in the book of Acts when, when, the, when the, the people who are given to idolatry or when, when, he, um, when he heals, you know, we heal the person uh, and, and uh, they wanted to, to bring out and do sacrifices unto him and they wanted to, to basically worship him as a God. He says, no, no, no. He's like, hold on a second. We're, you know, we're men just like you. He stopped them. He's not going to take that worship. Look what Jesus said unto him. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. On the he doesn't tell him he's wrong. On the contrary, he says, look, good for you. You believe I'm your Lord and your God. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus Christ affirms the words of Thomas when he said, My Lord and my God. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. One last place I'll be turned, Isaiah chapter 43. This is another one of my favorite places. Isaiah 9, 6 is one of my favorites. Isaiah 43 is another one of my favorites because normally when I have these discussions, it's with either a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness, someone who doesn't want to accept that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And of course, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have this big, big emphasis on Jehovah and, you know, the Lord Jehovah. He's the God and there's one God and they'll say that they believe in one God. In Isaiah 43, we're going to see Jehovah. Now, I usually, before I turn here, I preface this and I'll ask them. I'll say... Who is the Savior? Who is the Savior of the world? Who is the one that saves us? Without fail, they say Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Savior. Everybody will give you that answer. Look at Isaiah 43, verse number 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. There's again those phrase, I am. I am He. Before me... There was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There is no Savior other than the Lord. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you've got a major problem right now. Because who's the Savior? Is it Jesus or is it Jehovah? Who is the Savior? Jehovah just said, that's what, when you see Lord in all caps, that's Jehovah. It's just the, 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 the English representation of Jehovah. It means Lord. We see Lord in all caps, and in their Bible will say Jehovah. Beside me, there is no Savior. There, there's no one else. I'm the Savior. Well, guess what? That's not a problem for me. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Jehovah is the Savior. People have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Why? Because they're believing on the Lord. They're believing on Jehovah. And they're believing on the Lamb that hasn't even, hadn't even come yet to be, uh, to be crucified and to, and to take away the sins of the world. There is no Savior. When, when, when there's three that are one, one Lord and one faith and one God, one baptism, the Bible says there's not a problem in a triune God. But if, but if, if they're completely separate, if Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh, you've got a major problem. Isaiah 45 basically says the same thing. Two chapters later, Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from the ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. 
Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Does that phrase sound a little familiar? The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we see all these references in Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 45. And when you read the whole chapter, there's even more. I mean, these are just a few that I pulled out. You have them turn in their Bible, the New World Translation, especially with the Jehovah's Witness. In the beginning was the Word, their Bible says, and the Word was with God and the Word was a God. Is Jesus Christ God or is he a God? If he's a God, then, then what's the Bible talking about here when God said in Isaiah 43, Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. It's a contradiction. And that is a major contradiction in their false version of the perversion of the Bible. And this is a very, that's a very good one to point out because... If you have somebody who might have been brainwashed and, and, they're, and they're, you know, they're mixed up in a false religion and they've been lied to and deceived, if they're honest and if they really are interested in seeking the truth, this will stump them. They, they will not. I've never heard an answer for this by any Jehovah's Witness ever that was satisfactory even to them. Never. This has always stumped them. I've always had them. Now, they haven't always gotten saved, but the point is trying to at least break that conditioning, break that, that brainwashing they have and break through and, and expose the lies that they're believing in. But I don't want this whole sermon to turn into a, to a, just a proof text against false religions because what we're celebrating and what, what I'm trying to get across today is the spirit of Christmas and why Christmas is so important. And the first major reason is that God himself, God the creator of the universe, God the Savior, the Lord, who has done so many mighty works and acts, became a man. And not only to become a man, he started off, he became a baby. He became an infant. A child, just like my little boy back there in that car seat, completely helpless to your surroundings, completely just, just vulnerable. God Almighty became a little, uh, an infant, a baby that was born into this world, born into a poor family. We know that they're poor. We saw in Luke chapter 2 that uh, when it referenced them bringing Jesus to the temple to get when he got circumcised and they were following all of the law, the sacrifice that needed to be made, it says that they brought the um, the two young turtle, the turtle doves or the pigeons. That's that was if you couldn't afford to bring the lamb sacrifice, if you couldn't afford the bigger sacrifice, then this is what was acceptable when you had a, when you had a child, a man-child born. So this proves that they did not have that much money because this is the sacrifice that they brought. They were not able to afford the bigger sacrifice. And he was brought into a humble family, a humble home, a humble place. He was born in a manger. They couldn't even, there wasn't even any room in, in the inn. They weren't able to stay at the inn. So when he was born, Exposed to the world, he was just just in a place where the where the animals had had shelter, and that's where he was born. No uh, fancy, you know, from from day one, nothing fancy. Very humble, very very meek uh, beginning. The humanity of Christ is so important not to be overlooked. Now. I spent a lot of time talking about the deity of Christ and how he is God in the flesh. And oftentimes we have a tendency maybe to, to overshadow the fact that while he was God Almighty, he was also completely a human. And this is something that is a little bit mind-boggling. And I don't claim to have a perfect 100% grasp of how this is even possible. But it is. I believe the Bible to be true. He became a human. God was able to, to take on certain limitations. He didn't have all knowledge and all wisdom. We see that as he was growing. It says in Luke 2, verse number um, 40, it says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. 
and he was um, so he was growing and increasing his wisdom he was increasing his knowledge as he got older so we know that God is all knowledgeable well Jesus Christ who is God in the form of flesh he limited himself he did not even allow himself to have all knowledge he he grew and uh, and was was a was a human being a man like us he needed to be cared for as a baby and then we even see that he was subject to his parents in um, in verse number 42 the Bible talks about Jesus when he was 12 years old. Verse number 42, it says, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went to day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. So he hangs back. He's, 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 you know, his whole family got this big group. They're leaving the feast, and they're traveling back home, and Jesus stays behind. And there's so many people, they must think like, like, oh, he's with one of the relatives, he's somewhere else. And then they realize they've gotten a day's journey already outside of Jerusalem, and they're like, wait a minute, where's Jesus? So they have to go back and try to find him. And so they go back into Jerusalem and they see him and they find him in the temple in verse number 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now, obviously, Jesus was a remarkable child. He was God in the flesh, and he had a lot of wisdom and understanding and knowledge, and he grew probably rapidly, was able to, to understand a lot. He had the Holy Spirit just, just, I mean, he is God. He, he is able to gain this, this great understanding. But he was still a child, and he was still growing and asking questions and learning. Verse 48, and when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, just as a real side note, I don't want to get into this too, too deeply, but you know, we believe in the King James Bible, we believe it's a perfectly preserved word of God. And one of the mistakes that the new versions will say is it calls Joseph Jesus' father in Luke chapter 2. Now, the King James here records... Mary speaking unto Jesus in verse 48 and say, Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So people who want to who wanna attack us for, for our stance and say, See, look, even the King James calls Joseph Jesus his father. Well, no, the King James doesn't call Joseph Jesus his father. Mary did, though. See, what we have to understand in, in the recorded words, when somebody is speaking in the Bible... The Bible accurately records what that person said. Now, just because a person says something that's recorded in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that that statement is completely 100% factually correct. For example, the Bible says that, that Satan is a great deceiver and there's no truth in him at all. Yet when he talked to Jesus, he was trying to quote scripture. Well, if you compare it, the scripture that he quoted, it wasn't, all, it wasn't all exactly correct. Now, the Bible records what Satan said because those are the exact words that Satan said. And that is true. That is a fact. Just like these are the words that Mary said. But by Mary calling Joseph Jesus' father, she was not correct because God was the father. She was, you know, Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost and Mary's egg, not from Joseph at all. So while Joseph was the stepfather, while Joseph was acting as a father figure, humanly speaking, to raise the child, he was not his father. And when you read throughout the, the, the King James Version, you will never see Joseph referred to as the boy's father, except in this one verse where Mary is actually doing the speaking, because that's what she said. But look at how Jesus then even rebukes Mary for calling Joseph his father. Verse 49, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So she said, my, you know, Thy father and I have sought thee. And he says, Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? So he corrects her in a way, it's a, it's a subtle way. It's not like he's just slamming her or rebuking her. He's saying, look, don't you know that I should be about my father's business? 
because God was his father. Look at verse number 50 then. It says, And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. As Jesus was growing up as a child, he still needed to, I mean, he was perfect. He was sinless. So as a child, he needed to be subject unto his parents. So his parents said, hey, Jesus, it's time to go. We're going home now. He had to come and go with them. And he submitted himself to their authority in his life because as a human being, as a child, he had to, to be under their authority. The same way that my children need to be under my authority as their father. Jesus was under the, the authority of his parents until he um, you know, became of age and was able to, to grow up and be, become his own man. But he was subject unto them. And then in verse 52 it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. So as he's growing, he's increasing his wisdom. He's increasing, you know, physically, uh, increasing his height, his stature, and um, in favor with God and man. I think that's kind of important too, that, that the older he gets and the more he does, he's more favorable in the sight of God and in the sight of men. He's just growing up to be a great man. And it's a, you know, all these little details point to the fact that, that somehow God was able to take these limitations and become a man that needed to grow, that needed to learn, that needed to do all these things. While we're still in Luke 2, I don't want to turn yet. We've we're gonna, we're gonna, we got one more place we're going to turn. So what should the spirit of Christmas be? We see already that, 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 it's, that it's a very special day. God himself, the creator of the universe, became a man. He became a boy. He became a baby. He, he came up with humble beginnings. We see the joy in verse number 10 of this event. It says, And the angel said unto him, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Why is it such a great day? There should, there should be, and this is why the part of the, the spirit of Christmas should be a time of great joy. It should be happiness. And why should we be so happy? Because a Savior was born. A Savior, the Savior of the world, the, the, the man who came to save the world from their sins, to reconcile us back to God, because we have been separated in, in a sense with, with our sin. We've, we've gotten on God's bad side by breaking His law. God, God has a judgment associated for us. But look, the Savior came into the world to take that away, to reconcile us back to the Lord and to bring us into good favor with Him. The Savior was born. This is an exciting day. We should be excited about this just as much as they were when the, when the shepherds came and they saw Him and they left rejoicing. They had a lot of joy and happiness and they started telling everybody about it. You know, the angels appeared on the shepherds and they went and, and they beheld the baby as He lay in the manger just as it was explained unto them. They followed that star and they came to Him and He said, Look, here's the baby. And he, uh, it was exactly the way the angels described it to him. They left rejoicing and telling other people about Christ. You say, yeah, you know, what an amazing time that would have been to be a part of when the Savior was actually born. Hey, yeah, I agree, that would have been exciting, but you know what, it's still exciting today. There are still a lot of people. I mean, why was it exciting to them? Why did they spread the news and tell everyone about a Savior? Because it's exciting news. It's important news. Hey, there's great joy. A Savior was born. He's going to save the world. Well, hey, we have the same exact reason to be joyful and happy and to proclaim unto a lost world. Hey, a Savior was born. It may have been some 2,000 years ago, but a Savior was born nonetheless. And you need to learn about them. You need to hear about them. You need to get saved. And that's exciting. And that is an important message. And that's a reason to go out and proclaim Jesus Christ. 
Let's keep this in mind and have the same attitude of the shepherds. And maybe if you do gather together with family or friends and someone's not saved, what a better time to talk about the Savior that was born than Christmas, the day that we set aside to celebrate His birth. Do you really know the Savior? You say, why do we celebrate Christmas? And most people give the right answer. You know, you say, oh yeah, well, it's the birth of Christ. Yeah, but do you know, the do you know that He's the Savior of the world? Do you know what that means, that He is the Savior? Do you know what that means? He came to save your soul. That all you have to do is believe on Him and trust Him alone for your salvation and you will be saved for eternity. That's why it's such a great message. That's why it's such great news. Now the other aspect I want to point about, out about the spirit of Christmas. Turn if you would to Philippians chapter 2. And the spirit that I think we need to have as Christians around Christmas time is the same spirit that Jesus Christ had throughout his entire life. And that's the spirit of humility. Being humble. Being low in our own eyes. Being people who aren't, you know, as especially, you know, and, and kids, I want you to listen to this especially. I know what it's like to be a kid around Christmas time. I was one once for many years. And as I mentioned before, it's one of, it was one of my favorite holidays, and it still is. But as a child, one of the, the reason why it was my favorite time is because of all the presents that you get. That's why, I, I'll be honest with you, that, that, was, that is the reason why Christmas was my favorite holiday, is because I love waking up on Christmas morning and having a whole stack of presents to open up. That's what I loved about it. But you know what? That's not what we should really be loving about Christmas. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a gift that someone gives to you. So don't think that you're sinning because you enjoy receiving gifts. But that, there's so much more to what Christmas is about than just the receipt of gifts. For one, the Bible says that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And that is true. And if you don't believe me, start trying it. You say, yeah, but I love all the gifts that I get. You know what? You'll love it even more if you can give that many gifts to people, if you can show them. And that's, that's something as a parent you start to understand a lot more as you get older especially and you see your children and you like to give them gifts and just other people in general. It's, it's always nice to be able to give gifts unto other people. But um, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 15, 33, you don't have to turn there. It says, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Jesus Christ has a name above all names. He is honored above everybody. But before he got that honor, he started off with humility. He was a humble, the humble baby, humble beginnings. And everything that he did in his life can be marked by humility. Imagine having the knowledge and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And, and even as he grew, I mean, people were amazed at him as a 12-year-old boy. The doctors and the lawyers, they were amazed at his intellect and at his great questions and his reasoning and his understanding of the law. They were amazed at him at 12. And to have this type of intelligence, to have this type of wisdom, to have this type of a heart and spirit, and to still be able to do the right thing and to treat people the way that he treated them, with love and with compassion, and even when they hated him and wanted him dead, to have a loving heart and to have the, the, the humility to say, you know, it, it, and it takes a lot. I, I, there's been, I'm not some like super smart person, but there's certain things that I know a lot about. And... There's something about being right. And when someone else is wrong, you know, maybe you get an argument, disagreement or something, and you just know, like, I've got all the facts. It can be difficult to be a humble person instead of just sticking with, no, I'm right, I'm right. You know, and just, that becomes so much more important than what are you even trying to accomplish with that person? Why, you know, are you willing to let just being right drive a wedge between you as opposed to, um, helping that person even when they're wrong. Even if they think that they're, that they're right. That doesn't matter. You don't have to prove yourself that, that, or prove to the world that I'm right and they're wrong. Now, I'm not saying to compromise what you believe or, or to back down on your belief, but there are so many times that you could be right about something and be humble at the same time. 
in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves and try to try to show them instead of saying you know calling them an idiot or stupid or how can you not believe this having a humble heart and approaching them and just say hey have you thought about this way if, I mean the, the example I've been using all night the Jehovah's Witness right you don't necessarily have to you know, if you you're going out soul winning you end up talking to someone maybe a friend at work or something there are all this you don't have to be like oh man you guys you're part of a cult. I can't believe you believe that nonsense. What are you, an idiot? You know, you're just brainwashed and just, just, just rail on them like that. Now, what you're saying might be true. But the humility and the meekness is gonna, is gonna, should take over and, and allow you to, to be able to present in a way to, that, that's loving towards them and show them that, hey, why don't you look at this? Because I think there's, there's a contradiction here and I think you need to, to analyze this because there's a problem that I see with what you're believing you know, and be able to, to tactfully approach something like that. Let's see the mind that Christ had in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. And I think this embodies the true spirit of Christmas that we all need to have with all the distractions around us, with all the, the, the craziness of the holiday time we need to be able to just chill out a little bit and relax and, and keep a humble spirit. You know, it, it, especially like the driving is funny because everyone's in a hurry, right? I mean, you want, you want to get stuff done. I'm going to the store. I got to do this. I got to do this. And I know what it's like to be busy. But especially at this time, it's like, well, what are you getting all busy about? You usually are getting stuff for other people to make them happy. But you're willing to, to, to cut people off and, and give them your sign language and, and yell at them and curse them out and everything else. Like, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're completely missing the point. Like, you're, you're, you're trying to do good things for other people while at the same time you're just, you're, you're, you're going nuts over, over someone else's. And maybe they make a mistake. Okay, let's, let's be a little humble and let's forgive them. Right? And that's just one aspect. I know that's an easy one to, to pick on. But... Um, but it, there's a lot of road rage and stuff going on and we need to, to keep ourselves in check. Let's keep ourselves with the right spirit. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse number 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Paul's admonishing the Philippians here. Look, if there's any consolation that you can find in Jesus Christ, any, any comfort of His love and fellowship, let's have that same mind and the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse number three, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Right? Through fighting and just your, your own vain glory of puffing yourself up. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. When you esteem someone better than yourselves, what you're doing is you're saying, you know what? I'm not as important as you. That's really what it means. To esteem someone better than yourself, you say, you know, we, we go back to the, to the table, you know, and two of us are walking there at the same time and there's one cookie left. When you esteem someone better, you say, you know what? You, you go ahead and take that. It's, you know, it's, it's a silly example. I get that. But it's having that type of a mindset when it comes to anything of just being able to esteem someone better than yourself. Kids, listen up to this. Here's a great example that will fit well with you. When your brother or your sister is, is maybe, you know, you both want to play with the same toy, with the same thing, you want to do the same thing, if you're esteeming them better than yourself, you'll just let them have it. You go ahead and you can, you can play with that. I'll play with that when you're done. That's the type of an attitude that we can have that was the same type of an attitude that Christ had. Let's keep reading here in chapter number 2, though, because it goes on and, 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 and explains this even more in depth. Verse number 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We don't all just need to be wrapped up in, in our own life and saying, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. And I know what this is like as a man being responsible for my family. I need to make sure my family is in order. I need to make sure that, that what I do and everything, you know, the money that I make and everything is going to satisfy the needs of my family. He's saying, don't just do that, but also think about on the things of others. So we should be able to have an attitude or heart where it's not all just about us. 
But we're also keeping in mind other people and saying, you know, if there's something else I can do for them too. Now, as a man, you, you, you do need to watch for your family. You have to do that. He's not saying not to do that. Notice he says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, which means in addition to, not just your own things, but also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, again, one more verse, talking about the deity of Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, became a servant, a worker for you, for men, for his own creation. He became a servant. This is the mind of Christ. This is the spirit of Christ. And this should be the spirit of Christmas. Being that of a servant, verse number 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, so because of this, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God lifted Jesus Christ up because of his humility. As I, I mentioned earlier, the Bible says before honor is humility. If you want to be honored, if you want to be held in regard and esteemed highly, you cannot lift yourself up. When you lift yourself up, God will bring you low. That's the way that God works. He says, no, no, no. If you really do want to be respected, if you want to have that type of, of uh, glory or honor, Make yourself a servant. The, the, the disciples were, were talking amongst themselves and they said, you know, they wanted to know who was going to be the greatest. And Jesus said, you know, in the world, you've got these rulers, you've got these other great men that have authority. He says, but that's not the way it is among you. If you want to be the greatest, let him be the servant. You want to be the servant of all. You want to be the one who's doing the most for other people. That's what's going to make you the greatest. When you have a, a humble heart and a humble attitude and you can go and say, you know what? It doesn't matter what I get. It doesn't matter about me. Just like John the Baptist said, you know, I must decrease, but he must increase. His entire ministry was about Jesus Christ succeeding, not about himself succeeding. When his disciples stopped following him, he was pointing and saying, look, go follow Jesus. He's right there. He didn't care about making everything all about him. And you know what? That's not what I care about, and that's not what this church cares about. We're not about just getting a ton of people in here for my sake. What we're trying to do is bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and trying to point as many people as possible to Christ and say, look, it's all about Him. And this Christmas, try to make this day of celebration all about Him and what He did for us and the humility and the servitude that He did and the shame that God in the flesh had to suffer people spitting in His face and smacking Him upside the head, putting a crown of thorns on His head and nailing Him to a cross to be, have a death that is considered a curse amongst men. He became a curse for us because He loved us. He humbled Himself to the point of death and even the death of the cross. Our Savior did that for us. Praise God our Savior was born. What great news. That's the great news. That's why there is so much rejoicing at the birth of Christ. That's why we should be so happy this time of year. We had a Savior born. And we didn't deserve one bit of Him. But He loved us enough to sacrifice Himself for us and go through everything that He went through for us. Let's try to have that mind of Christ. Let's look on others and, and try to esteem them better than ourselves and think, I want to see them succeed. I want to do what I can to help other people succeed. That's the spirit of Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful gift that you've given to us, God, eternal life. We know that we deserve 
so much worse. We, we deserve an eternal death, dear Lord, but thank you for loving us. Thank you for, for looking on your creation and having mercy and long-suffering, dear Lord. And we thank Jesus for, for the humility and, and the attitude that he had in becoming a servant and, and the righteous works that he performed and the, the sacrifice that he gave of himself, completely freely giving of himself to save us sinners, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us and stir up our spirits. God, we don't meet together very often, but help us as we go our separate ways and we start to meet with family and we take a time of celebration that we don't lose sight of this fact and we, and we don't forget about it and put you aside, but that we could, we could honor and glorify your name and your son who deserves all the glory and the honor. God, help us to, to be bold and spirited, to, to talk about Christ, to mention the Savior, and, and to express our joy and gladness in the, in the free gift that you've given to us. God, help us to share that with others and help us to point other people to Christ, dear Lord. Give us a, a humble spirit and give us a, a temperate spirit, dear Lord, and one that's, um, that would be pleasing to you and... and that we would be able to behave ourselves in a way that you can look at and say that, that you are happy to be our Father, dear Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.